great uh, uh, day to celebrate 50 years. And I'm very honored to be invited to uh, give a talk in this meeting. So uh, this is going to be a personal history, I'm afraid, uh, although the um, PDB uh, was founded around 10 years after I first went in uh, to Dorothy Hodgkin's lab. But I'm going to talk about the, the 50 years mainly, um, and that is from the x-ray structure of the two zinc insulin hexma, which we solved in 1969, so two years uh, before the PDB. I got into a big trouble because we didn't submit the coordinates immediately, and they, I think they weren't submitted until uh, the, the next year. Um, I'm going to go from there to the recent uh, resolution revolution in cryo-EM, and um, I think this is a good cause to celebrate uh, our five decades. So in my talk, I'll start off uh, with the insulin crystals, which came from Dorothy Hodgkin's lab. And uh, those crystals were first started uh, in the study by her in, um, I, I think, 1934. And so that was uh, a good 30 years before I arrived in, uh, in the lab to work full time. And um, there's uh, Dorothy Hodgkin, uh, when I joined the lab, almost the day I joined, she got the Nobel Prize. So I can't claim any contribution to that, uh, but she was just an amazing person. And um, we went on to define the three-dimensional structure which they'd mentioned in her Nobel Prize uh, uh, statement. Um, and it took us another five years really to solve the structure at high resolution, but very much Dorothy's work. I'll briefly mention uh, a, a decade or so later, the HIV V protease story. And um, more recently, the SARS uh, story, just very briefly, because these are areas where uh, structural biology and protein crystallography um, can and have contributed. And I'll uh, come to the end of the five decades of my story with cryo -EM, talking about uh, another uh, multi-protein complex, rather similar to the one you've heard from Julie. It's got around uh, six uh, components in this picture. And of course, we've moved to cryo-EM. And I'll mention as I go, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Joel, that I've always been interested in using this from the time I started working with companies on insulin 60 years ago or so, um, because that's where we got our insulin crystals, right through to forming companies, um, even though I have uh, left-wing politics. And so I'll mention a little bit about the ability to find drug candidates. In fact, in my company, we have two drugs on the market, one of them selling half a billion dollars a year. So protein crystallography can be useful as well. So let me go back because I would just want to mention that we're talking about the last uh, five decades. Uh, but Dorothy Hodgkin, my mentor, was in uh, really at the beginning. I just thank the directors, by the way, of the Protein Data Bank, as I, in case I forget to mention that right at the end. But I want to uh, start where protein crystallography started, and that was with my mentor, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin. And I went to join Dorothy Hodgkin because I'd read J.D. Bernal. As you mentioned, I was inclined to left-wing politics. I was very active. I ran the city of Oxford as a left-wing Labour councillor, pedestrianised the centre, stopped the motorway going through and so on. Uh, but Dorothy had worked with J.D. Bernal, and I read uh, J.D. Bernal's work on uh, really the history of uh, of science uh, with a very left-wing view. Um, 
way before I went to uh, Oxford in 1961. So I discovered Dorothy Hodgkin through Bernal and uh, Dorothy and Bernal had got the first crystals uh, of um, a, a protein in the X-ray beam. They were of pepsin. Uh, they had a thin walled capillary because Bernal worked on water and he realized that you had to have water in order to keep the crystals in the state where they would diffract. Their first studies, they didn't do this and they didn't diffract. And so you got this marvelous first protein crystallography diffraction pattern. And uh, they sent it to Nature in 1934. Um, and you can see they said that now that a crystalline protein has been made to give X-ray photographs, it's clear we have the means of checking them. And by examining the structure of all the crystalline proteins arriving at far more detailed conclusions. However, that was 1934. And I think what they didn't uh, really realize is that it was going to take another 20 years really before protein structures uh, began to be solved, uh, great challenges. But Dorothy started on the crystals of insulin in 1934, two years after the pepsin crystals. And um, of course, she got a diffraction pattern very quickly. And uh, there were cryo-EM pictures of the small crystals called granules in the pancreas where the insulin stored. And we all knew even before we had the crystal structure. And I think you can see the hexagonal shape of the granule and the threefold axis of the crystals, that there was a relation between the crystals that are in the pancreas where insulin is stored and the crystals we were studying. And that was very reassuring. The great thing about the insulin uh, group in Dorothy Hodgkin's lab is that it was completely multi uh, in every sense. So it was um, people from multiple countries, as you can see a uh, guy uh, from, um, uh, and Eleanor from New Zealand and Australia, Margaret Adams from England, Vijayan from India, and Ted Baker, um, again from New Zealand area. And uh, it was very much um, an international activity. And it was that that I first saw in 1961, so 60 years ago, um, when I uh, realized that I could go in, into Dorothy's lab, which I did for a short course, and met this amazing community from all over the world. One of the first people to come to the lab who was there when I first started working in it in 1964 with Siv Ramasation. So I soon uh, learned that um, crystallography was really multicultural. It was pretty well gender balanced in our group. Uh, and um, it, it, it was a very exciting area to be in. So um, this is uh, the first results we got. I soon realized that there was beauty uh, and uh, my grandfather was an, uh, an artist, a professional artist, in fact, and um, I spent my youth doing uh, painting and artwork. And so the insulin, I could see immediately had similarities to some of the windows like the Chartres Cathedral window with pseudo threefold symmetry. Um, uh, you could see the crystals um, uh, relating to the functional storage granules, and you could see that the people, this is um, me uh, uh, on the right hand side, but you can see uh, that um, uh, Dorothy was very intent in, in discussion. And I think the, the, the comments that Joe made about my long hair uh, and um, scruffy appearance, um, you can see from that picture. Um, I'm surprised I ever got uh, elected by the people of Oxford to run the city looking like that, but I did. So 
Um, I went on, left um, Oxford after traveling around the world for most of a year, ending up in India. Uh, I ran a modern jazz group. I studied Indian music, um, but also uh, when I got back, I realized I had to move from Oxford. So Dorothy arranged for me to go down to Sussex and I started thinking about what I could learn from my structural work on insulin about evolution and whether in fact evolution of proteins was Darwinian or due to selectively neutral mutations. And this was one of the first papers that were published in Nature on that theme in 1975. But as was mentioned, um, I uh, was very conscious that um, we knew a lot about protein crystallography because we had people from Cambridge and Oxford around us who've done all the work, but all no, almost nobody had written about the methodology. Eleanor Dodson was an amazing uh, person to work with in those early days. She'd written a lot of software and she put into software many of the methods that Dorothy's uh, group had developed, including using anomalous scattering, but nothing much was written. And at that time, David Phillips uh, came just after he sold the structure of lysozyme with Louise Johnson, and we moved to a new lab in Oxford. And so I got to know um, Louise Johnson. And David encouraged us uh, to move from the article he'd written with Tony North in 1969 on protein crystallography to write something a little bit more substantive. And that ended up with Louise and myself uh, eventually um, writing a book on protein crystallography, which um, I uh, thought was amazingly helpful to me. And so Louise and I just wrote everything that we knew about protein crystallography in the book. It ended up with quite a few hundred pages and um, has been um, really quite a useful textbook, as Joel uh, mentioned. So that was all very exciting. See Dorothy talking with Louise and um, uh, having uh, Dorothy influencing us was amazing. So um, nevertheless, um, I realized that all of the insulin work that we'd done uh, was dependent on industry. And despite my left wing uh, background, I was always very involved in industry, in this case, in Novo, Wellcome, Eli Lilly, all companies that made insulin. And I got to know the people there. So when I left Oxford and went up to set up my own laboratories, first in Sussex, and then I was very lucky when I was 34, I I uh, got the main professorship in Birkbeck and we had around a hundred people and I began to think not only about doing protein crystallography but thinking about how useful it could be and of course knowing that for example the pepsin family including renin uh, which is involved in lowering blood pressure I realized that this would be very interesting to companies and I started talking to Pfizer, ICI, Park Davis, and so on. And so we used uh, the structure of um, the aspartic proteinases, the pepsin family, to model initially the structure of renin, which is involved in blood sugar control. And this was one of the first um, studies, well, the first study I was involved in of understanding selectivity in a long groove filling pockets on the right and uh, hydrogen bonds on the left. And if I was going to make new drugs um, to bind in this molecule, which was required in order to control blood pressure, I would have to satisfy the spatial and the hydrogen bond and charged interactions. So this was the beginning of thinking about structure, specificity and catalytic mechanisms and how we could convert it into uh, drug discovery. And I also realized at that time 
that complicated proteins like renin uh, were actually um, um, developed from much simpler systems. So I predicted the uh, ancestor of pepsin and renin, which you can see on the left, as a symmetrical dimeric structure. And then I spent the next six years on Saturday mornings looking in the literature to find out whether that molecule was anywhere around. And I published this paper in 78, but it wasn't until 84 that we really found it. And of course it was the HIV protease. So that was coded by the HIV gene. And I was able to take that and um, do some modeling on it and predict it, what this target protein in HIV might be. And as I designed molecules to inhibit these proteases before, I realized I could modify those to inhibit the HIV protease. But at that time, I got highly criticized by um, uh, several uh, people, including Max Brutz, who said I shouldn't uh, speculate too much. So I did my drug discovery a little bit uh, quietly for a few years, but we had the HIV protease structure modeled uh, around 1984, but I waited until 1989 to publish the structure, which was pretty well right as we predicted it. And then um, uh, got structures with new ligands in it and realized that this was a way of approaching and getting new drugs for HIV. And um, I also realized at that time that we were likely to get resistance and started plotting the resistance mutations onto the molecule. So all this background then encouraged me to think about doing something commercial. And um, although I was uh, heavily involved in running the city of Oxford as a left-wing Labour councillor, the only way I could get this work uh, that we were thinking about in drug discovery commercialized was to form a company. And Haran Jyoti came out of uh, the, the big company he'd been in, Glaxo Welcome, and um, we decided to form a small company with the chemist Chris Abel who very recently died, very sadly, and we founded a company, Aztecs. And the idea was that we would take the little fragments and bind those, and then uh, we could work with about 700 of those, and then we could elaborate them into uh, billions of different molecules. And so we started off with three people in the lab, and then we managed to um, build up and get funding. We went to 80 employees, and so this was 1999, the foundation, uh, 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 the founding of the company. And then we got all these components in place. Uh, we built a new building just up the road. Um, many people, I got featured in the local paper as why was this left-wing guy forming a company and how on earth did he manage to get um, uh, 886 million as a deal? but we got candidate drugs, eight into clinical trials. And um, very quickly, we then got uh, a, a drug into the US FDA filing of new drugs. And this was then commercialized for breast cancer. And uh, that was the first of the drugs. It took us around um, 10 years uh, to get um, even started. And as you can see, almost 20 years to get the drug on, on the market. So uh, we have approval of several drugs. So protein crystallography can be useful, but I stayed in the lab and we worked on complicated systems like um, the targets for DNA repair. And this is rather reminiscent of the nice talk that Julie gave in that almost all these systems in cells are really multi-component. So what I've been doing over the last 20 years is looking at complex multi-component systems, trying to understand them. And of course, always in my mind is whether there is uh, some 
thing I can do in drug discovery. But so this example uh, involves, um, I just go back, uh, a, an enzyme, a kinase, which has 4,000 amino acids called DNA PKCS. And this, uh, with the help of a molecule called Ar Artemis, and uh, and also um, uh, uh, other molecules, it binds to broken ends of DNA, brings them together in what's called non-homologous end joining, and they're mended. So I set out uh, around 20 years ago to try and define all the components of these complex multi-protein and nucleic acid systems. And so what we've done is, um, define a number of structures. Um, uh, so I showed you uh, our first PDB structure. I forgot to mention as we went past it, that it was one of the first ones of the insulin um, in the PDB. And, and now um, towards 50 years later, we began to put in uh, protein structures of these very complex components. And the biggest one is the DNA PKCS. And so we started uh, many years ago doing cryo EM, but it was only the resolution revolution that really allowed us to get higher resolution with x-rays. And I just very quickly show how we took this 4,000 amino acid structure that we solved at 4.3 angstrong using x-rays and then turned it into using cryo-EM to a 2.8 angstrong resolution structure last year um, that was published um, in uh, Nature well, in Science, this particular one. Um, and it, you can see what a huge structure it is. And this is just one component of a seven or eight multi-component system. And here cryo-EM, I think, takes over from X-ray. So that's my story. It's uh, five decades from uh, X-ray structures of insulin to uh, high resolution structure of DNA repair with multi-component systems, mainly done through cryo-EM. I should mention uh, my uh, colleagues here, Amanda Chaplin in particular, who's worked on this very high resolution system. And there we have uh, a structure that's just um, under uh, review now for publication, which is a high resolution structure of the DNA PK and, and many other components. And I should say other people have been working in parallel on this and have similar structures. So um, it's all a little competitive, but very friendly at the same time. And these multi-protein systems of what we are able to get with the cryo EM. So that's all going into the um, system, into uh, the PDB. In parallel, we've been working on the SARS uh, database. And um, here's an example of a high resolution part using cryo EM of the SARS CoV 2 that we've not yet published. Um, but clearly, one can move into these areas quite quickly and get high resolution structures. And I'm not going to talk about it, but we've uh, written a lot of software, not only things like Modeler, which have 12,000 citations, but a lot of software analyzing mutations that occur in um, uh, many of these drug discovery programs and uh, thinking of the way that we get um, and redesign or repurpose old drugs and other molecules um, to cope with the drug resistance. So finally, uh, just let me show you uh, my present team. Um, I'm supposed to be retired, um, but um, you can see we have lots of, of very, very um, enthusiastic people around. We continue, um, just before the group got a little bit smaller, uh, we could speak over 30 languages I discovered in in the team. So we're from all over the place. There are a couple of English. And um, I should also say that I'm very much indebted to Lynn Sibanda, uh, Zimbabwe originally, 
who uh, is my wife of over 40 years and um, who uh, retired a little while ago, uh, but we've done protein structures together. Protein crystallography is a wonderful thing to do. And let me just quote a lesson from Dorothy Hodgkin, that science must be international, interdisciplinary, and gender balance. And I think that's a very good message. And I think we've seen it in the presentations. I think protein crystallography with the influence of people like Dorothy Hodgkin many years ago has met many of those criteria. So I leave you with those sorts, thoughts and we celebrate 50 years, five decades of protein crystallography. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very, very much for your talk. I think the end, uh, what you say epitomizes a lot of what protein crystallography has been about throughout the years. I think it's been an unusually congenial with only every so often a bit of competition, but it's been mostly friendly competition. And what you've shown in terms of international aspects are really true. But I have a question for you. Not in a the, in, one. <laughs> just I'll, I'll let other people talk afterwards, but you remember around the year 2000, 1999, Alwyn and Carl Brandine, Alwyn Jones and Carl Brandine wrote these papers where there were five wrong X-ray structures that came out about the same time. One even traced completely backward from the C-terminus to the N-terminus. And what I'm just curious about with the revolution and resolution, these structures just can't be done by X-ray, as you said. Are you in any way fearing, not, not your work, but in general, other people's work that some of them may just be wrong and, and, and people will get the wrong conclusion because there is no free R factor yet or something like that even to give a hint if it's right. What do you think? Yeah, it's always something that worries me and you can imagine with 4,000 amino acids in DNA PKCS, how many hours and hours and hours I've been through it wandering around trying to move the sequence up and down. So this has been expressed as we increase the resolution over a 10 year period. So I, I think to be healthy, you have to worry about that. But I must say that I haven't talked about it today, uh, but uh, over the last uh, really, um, si uh, oh, it's uh, getting up to eight years now, I've been writing uh, with colleagues, but, uh, software using machine learning uh, and um, there I think we have an alternative way of testing things. I'm not sure whether the machine learning is, is going to be more reliable than us uh, but it's certainly a way of testing our hypotheses. Uh, the real trouble about this new development is you never quite know how you got from point A to point B <laughs> but, but sometimes if you get the same answer is rather reassuring. Yeah, in, the, in that same respect, um, I've always felt that Perdicus life has been fascinating and so on. And for drug discovery, it's clearly had enormous impact. But I think sometimes in fields outside of Perdicus life, if you can go to a meeting, a biochemistry meeting, people will show a slide or two of nice structures, but then they go right back to all the biochemistry and so on. Uh, do you think with this revolution and resolution, with these larger complexes, which begin to approach what biologists have seen with high resolution microscopes, very high resolution, that yeah. these blobs that now have atomic resolution detail will have a lot more impact on, on biology and biochemistry that, than our, our kind of old fashioned protein crystallography? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I very much do. And I, I think we've moved from a reductionist single molecule focus to sort of semi-complex uh, molecules. But what we have to realize that is if we just had sort of binary complex functional in a cell, you'd have a lot of noise. And so the only way the cell gets uh, at really accuracy and loses the noise is to have uh, cooperative assemblies. So things like DNA repair that I've been working on involve 10 or 11 different components that assemble in different stages. 
and I think biology has uh, really evolved to make sure it's accurate by using these highly complex multi-component systems. So I, I think we have no option but to go there. Uh, of course, we have to go there dynamically. So the other challenge is to get the time scales in. And some of the systems we've been working on, we've tried to use other techniques to, uh, to look at times. But of course, our limitation is really, uh, we're a bit static <laughs> when nature is dynamic. And I, I, my guess is that the PDB is going to evolve into structure and dynamic protein data bank. I, and, and I suspect even some of the mutations affects the dynamics of a protein, which, which we don't see in the static structures. Yeah, so. well, that's absolutely true. And we can show that now. So, yes. And, and quite a lot of the mutations that we've studied using the software I've developed using machine learning and that are actually distant, right, and they work allosterically. So they undoubtedly affect the dynamics of the protein. So I, I don't see any, any other questions in the Q&A, Tom, so I want to thank you okay. and the other two speakers. It was, it was a great session and it's been a great, great symposium and I look forward to a another 50 years i'm not sure how much of it i will see but i look forward to it and uh, and i will close the session but i would like to encourage all of the participants and attendees to go on to the poster session where you can also speak with uh, presenters here and other presenters and then later in the afternoon go to the second session that shoshana is going to chair and i wish you all a, a wonderful rest of the day and week no. bye bye tom good thanks for your great chairmanship joe no no it's, it's, it's really good to be here <laughs> bye bye yes.